Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway, and we are here to talk a little K-State football recruiting. It's time for your weekly update, and this is really a good time of the year for people to get a weekly update uh, because it seems really with the way that information is to be had at KSO right now, you could do uh, an every other day update and it would be loaded with a ton of guys. Uh, one of the big features for people this week was Commit Watch, which you do, and there were a ton of names on it. And really that that to me seems like probably the first place that we need to start because it does feel like K-State is on the verge of adding a lot of new commitments to this class. And you have been telling me and others for about a month and a half, two months now, not to panic. This class is going to fill up by a reasonable point, a reasonable point of the summer. And it seems like we're nearing that. Yeah, it really feels like the the dam is about to break. And I know that one of the first comments was, wow, this is a lot more people on here than normal. Like, yeah, it feels like we're, it's getting closer. And I, I said that I, I feel like I didn't have enough names on there. And I feel I feel like I'm still kind of right in that assessment. But they're they're extremely close on probably a double digit number of prospects and kind of you play out how recruitments are trending and you, you could even say that there's a little bit more because there's some guys that hadn't had offers for very long that are working on scheduling visits and a couple of them are coming within the next few weeks and there's some guys that they've kept been kind of on the doorstep on for a long time that are visiting at the end of the month so it really seems like that this could be a double digit commitment Maybe not month, but if you combine June and like mid July, I think it feels like there's gonna be a lot of fireworks going on. Yeah, well, let's let's start with probably one of the most notable guys in the mix here because I know people were talking about, well, you know, if you, you look at the ratings, some of these guys are not rated yet or that's not fully fleshed out. That's not really a big deal at this point in time because I mean, you can give some examples from from last year's class even just to kind of ease people. But uh, like we know Gus Hawkins, he was the first commit of the class last year. And he was just kind of trending along, trending along, whatever. It was fine. And then, boom, he shot up at the end and got that four-star status, was right around the top 50 in the on three ratings. And th this is – I think K-State and the staff has proven that if they're offering guys – they either know what they're doing. Well, that's not even an either. They know what they're doing, but in terms of what that guy will end up being is he's got a role that he can serve or they are just as good of evaluators, if not better, than the people that are making these rankings. Like They know that at the end of the day, this guy will move up. And Dylan Duff is a guy, the quarterback in the class, you've talked about already that, hey, he, he could be a, a candidate that by the time he gets to signing day, his rating will be higher than what it is now. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of examples that you can use. I used yesterday that like somebody like Trey Davis wasn't rated at this time last year and wasn't really on K-State's radar yet, but he didn't have a ranking and ends up being a four-star at the end of it. Uh, Jaquees Friday Demps is another one who didn't have a rating at this time last year, and when he did get a rating, he was either a mid or a, on some sites he was a two-star and ends up being near that four-star status by the end. K-State's a hard place to get an offer from. I mean, that's just kind of how it is because of how thorough they are and they really want to see kids work out and see them at the, in a camp setting. And so unless they're really blown away by you before they see you in a camp setting, they're probably not going to offer you. So I think that that kind of shows you how hard it is to get an offer from K-State. That's not a bad thing. I think that that's a good thing because of how selective they are. And it really shows you, okay, if they if they offer somebody and they immediately want to get a visit in, that means that they probably really, really like the the player that's coming in and that they want to get that wrapped up before other schools take notice. Because if you if you haven't noticed before, a lot of schools kind of notice who K-State offers and kind of if they were on the brink, they want to offer that prospect because they kind of know how well K-State evaluates. So I, I think that that's something to really keep in mind. And especially for these camp guys, because... Yeah, there has been some kind of discord about what does this mean that there's so many camp guys that are coming in on visits that they had just offered. 
I, I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. Like I, I mentioned that the 2023 class was kind of a combination of guys that they really wanted plus camp guys. The last class was kind of the same way. I think that, that that's just kind of how it goes because they wanted to see those guys in the camp setting and kind of got to see them, offered them, got a visit scheduled. And usually the way that that trends, it means that they're probably going to land at least some of these guys. And especially you go through the history of who k has offered at camps and has landed either uh, as a rising junior when they get the offer or as a rising senior before they get the offer. More often than not, the, that player ends up being a pretty productive player for K-State. No, oh, yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that some of those guys that K-State offers are, you know, they they get the K-State offer and then other people are like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we should be kind of looking around on what's going on there. And we've seen in the past that there are some guys that K-State wants that to be kept a little bit more quiet, that you did get that K-State offer. I, I'm trying to, I feel like we had an example in the 2024 class of a guy that we didn't even know that the K-State offer was there. And then this basically the second you found out about it, it was like ball game over. He's going to be a wildcat. So that's the kind of thing too, where there is stock put into what K-State does. And I would say that everybody always theorizes about how these guys get these ratings and it's like, oh, they get the bump because so-and-so offered, which I, I'm not going to dispel those rumors. Like I think I, I have thoughts that that's probably how some of this works out too. I do think that there's a realm that when – K-State gives out a football offer. The people that make these decisions and evaluating have to go, we might want to take a bigger and deeper look at this guy then and see, you know, do we need to get on and give him a rating quicker? Do we need to bump him up more? Because they seem to know what they're doing when they evaluate these guys, and we continue to see that. So I wouldn't worry about the status right now of these dudes. It's it's going to change down the road, and, and in all likelihood, it'll change for the better. But in terms of specific guys, one of the guys that was in that mix, he doesn't have his industry ranking uh, kind of flushed out yet, but he is a four-star on ESPN, three-star on 24-7. Adonis Moyes is a guy that you put in a prediction to K-State for uh, earlier this week, and he's a, he's a really intriguing wide receiver target from IMG Academy. Uh, what do you make of where this recruitment sits for K-State? Yeah, I think that uh if you were setting odds for somebody to be the next commit to k-state i think that i'd have Adon adonis moyes probably at like plus 130 as probably like the betting favorite to be the next commitment i just think that where that is kind of trending and going that k-state is the only official visit that he has scheduled and he moved the official visit up it just seems like that he wants to get out in front of the other wide receivers that are coming into Manhattan because there's been there's already been one with Jalen Cooper and there's going to be a few more in the coming weeks. So I think that he wanted to beat those other guys so he could secure his own spot. So I, I think that there's been some heavy mutual interest between the two sides since he visited in the spring. And I, it's never a bad thing to take an IMG Academy kid because they are a factory and if you can kind of get some inroads there, that'll that's always a good thing. And I, I really like where K State sits, and it would not surprise me if he calls it within maybe a day or so of being in Manhattan. Yeah, I was gonna say this feels like a like a Sunday night or or Monday type of commitment in the way that things are trending with moving the visit up and coming to town this weekend. So certainly a name to know and uh, to keep an eye on there uh, for a receiver out of Florida. Now, some of the other guys that you have on here, uh, they, they're dudes that we've talked about quite a bit. Leo Almanza is a guy from trophy club, Texas that we have, I think multiple times discussed and the offer sheet that if you go and look at it, it's, it's a, it's really a big time recruitment in terms of, what it means moving forward with the way that the Big 12 shapes up. Because if you go look at the on three RPM, the top five teams in this recruitment, Texas Tech, K-State, Utah, Baylor, and Houston. And this seems to be a player that number one, K-State really likes, but number two kind of fits into this master plan because you've been telling us from the start, like, yes, he's in Texas right now, but he has ties to St. Louis with all these other St. Louis prospects that K-State really wants in Manhattan. 
Yeah, so he is somebody that uh, some sources have told me that he probably has k in the lead going into this visit. And it's something where it's really one that you need to be aware of because there could be some potential fireworks after the visit as well. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he calls it after the visit. I also wouldn't be shocked if he continues to go on other visits. I, he, it's hard to read where his recruitment is and if he wants to shut it down after a visit to K-State. But he will be in Lubbock for an official visit to Texas Tech. I believe that begins today because he goes straight from Lubbock to Manhattan. So it is a recruitment that is interesting to see how it'll shake out with the new Big 12 because of all of the Big 12 schools involved. I think that Utah is probably the school that's on the outside looking in just with his official visit there taking place in April. We're now in June. He's going to see at least two more campuses by by then or by this the end of this week. So I, I think that the further it gets away from Utah, probably the worse off it is for them, which is why it's probably important for K-State to really kind of knock his socks off and get the commitment this weekend. Because, again, the further that it gets away from your official visit, it's not like full blown, like you're probably not going to land him, but it is something that you really need to be aware of and kind of do you want to be the team that sets the bar uh, like and take somebody's first visit like you did with Tristan Abram and Sean Hammerbeck or do you want to be like the last visit like they are for Lincoln Cure so it's something where you really need to juggle that and really just if they have a strong official visit I think that Almanza has a chance to pop all right, so we'll, we'll pause on talking about specific guys right here. I, I have a question for you then, since you're a recruiting guru, and you just kind of laid out some scenarios there. And I think more so on the basketball side, we've seen this be a thing in the past. If if a if you're if you're a, the the director of recruiting or a coach, and you get to pick, we get this guy at this point in his stages of official visits, and say there's four schools involved. Which visit number do you want to be? Do you want to be the tone setter number one? Do you want to be, you know, number two or number three? And so maybe you get the kid to shut it down right then and there. Or do you want to kind of be that last one like they are for Lincoln Cure and basically know, all right, this feels like a signal that we might be number one. And all we have to do is just go in there, play it really solid. And he's ours by the end of this. And there's no more sweating after the visit. So I, I want to hear what your preference is on this. See, this is a tough question because I think that so much of it varies on the kid and kind of how well you know where you stand in your recruitment. Because there's an argument that you can be made that can be made that if you think that you're in the lead, you'd probably rather have the the prospect come in first or second. But there's also that if you think that you're in the lead and nobody can really catch you, why would you not be last and get the get the commitment after that? So it's kind of up in the air. I, I kind of like being in that first, second territory just because I, I'm more impatient and think about uh, like what could go wrong in the scenario that you have somebody coming in last. But I, I also understand why you want to be that last team to really kind of sell. But I, I'm more of like get them in early and have them visit Manhattan and try and wrap it up early. But I think that's just more impatience on my part. I think it. I think it's helpful that the staff at K State is the way that they are, and you feel good about them because I, in in football, I don't, I don't worry about like Lincoln Cure's last visit being to K State. I just feel like okay, yeah, I'm not. That doesn't concern me. Now I know that like on the basketball side right now, people would still have reservations and be like, oh, okay, you know, because you know, there's you know some reports about guys that are visiting where and wherever that K State's still looking for there this week and you go, yeah, I'd probably would like if he came to K state before any of the others, uh, because there's a chance that that ends at any point, high school recruiting a little bit different than the transfer portal. I think the transfer portal, you, you could get a guy on campus for like five seconds and sway him immediately to not go on any of his other 12 visits. He has yeah. lined up after this. So, uh, footballs, there's at least a little bit more steadiness to, uh, how it ends up working out. All right, yeah, let's – oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll have something lined up for you. Oh, I was going to say, too, like it, it does really kind of 
be like transfer recruiting you probably want to be first but high school it doesn't matter necessarily as much but you do run that risk if you want to be that last weekend yeah all right so now let's continue on and some of the other guys that are notable in here uh one was just uh around for a camp i believe and pretty close to home another linebacker to talk about ashton moore the brother of austin moore and you would know that the second you saw him uh, yes quite they a few similarities playing. yeah uh <laughs> what do you what do you make of the uh ashton moore recruitment because really i think uh you feel like austin moore has turned into kind of this staple and one of like the epitomes of what k-state football is and it, i don't know that there's a ton of doubt that ashton moore ends up being a wildcat so maybe more than anything explain how k-state handles a recruitment like this and then what you would expect from a player like that uh, so for me, I think that, like you said, like I would be shocked if he isn't in K-State's class in some way. The The way to kind of go about it, I think, is that you know that he's probably going to be in the class, so it kind of puts pressure on the other linebackers that you're going after, uh, whether it be McGuire Richmond or Julius Sims or somebody like Will Hawthorne that was just offered. So I think that it kind of puts more pressure on those guys because you know that one of one spot's probably going to shrink. So I, I, I think that what you can expect from Ashton Moore is to be exactly like Austin because even how he plays is so, so similar to how Austin Moore plays. And, and I think that it's a, an interesting recruitment to see how it plays out too because I, I know that with how deeply tied Austin is to K-State. And now that Ashton has an offer from K-State, I wonder how many other schools even try to get involved. Like, I, I know that when Camden BB got his offer from K-State, a lot of schools just stopped trying because they knew how Cooper was so enriched in the K-State and how Bodden Cooper was and how Camden just wanted to follow in his footsteps. So I'd be surprised to see another school offer Ashton. And that doesn't mean that he's a bad player. It just means that some schools just don't want to waste their resources on something like that. Which probably smart uh, on, on their end of things. So that that's one end of the spectrum of visits and how everything's going to work out here. Uh, now, one other guy that I, I want to bring attention to real quick that falls in this category of people being enamored with ratings. He's got four-star status from one of the recruiting services right now, another receiver. Cartarius Brown is a guy that K-State has lined up, and you mentioned already off the top that, okay, Adonis Moyes, wide receiver getting in here before some of the others might want to wrap that up. Uh, what do you make of the other wideout that K-State will be seeing here soon? Uh, so Cartarius Brown is somebody that is really intriguing to me because he's somebody that, we haven't really heard much about because he's just on the quiet side and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that with how his recruitment is kind of playing out, it wouldn't really surprise me either way what he decides to do after this weekend, because there, there have been times where we don't really know much about somebody and then they end up committing and end up being one of the best players in the class. And Brown is another one of those guys that, you don't really know much about he's visiting K-State. I believe he has an official visit to Colorado State uh, next weekend. And I think that Oklahoma State is also trying to get involved and get an official visit. So he's somebody that I'm probably the most intrigued about this weekend, just because I personally don't really know a lot about where his recruitment lies. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's a good one. And I think you, you noted uh, where where else the interest is and what other visits might be on the horizon there. So something to kind of keep in mind and a good reason to go check out Drew's full commit watch over on KSO and uh, plenty of stuff that we didn't talk about here that you can find over there as well. Uh, let's finish things off because we talked a lot last week about the camps that were going on. You had one on Friday, then you had one on Sunday. Uh, what in your eyes uh, do, you, do you see on the horizon for camps? And what did you see on Sunday that was notable? Because we know there were a ton of offers that went out on Friday night and uh, Sunday a little bit slower in terms of that, but uh, a good crop of guys that were in town. Uh, so on the horizon, I think that you'll probably see more 2026, 2027 offers. I just think that with how everything's shaping up in the 2025 class, 
if you aren't going to blow K State away on the on at your camp, it's probably going to be harder for you to get an offer. So some some guys on Sunday that you really need to pay attention to are Will Hawthorne, who I mentioned, uh, linebacker from Iowa. He will also be taking an official visit to K State this month. So I mean that's that's one to really kind of pay attention to because that's another one that could just happen fast. Um, another one that is kind of a, a little fun for me because I, I actually didn't know that his dad played at K-State, but is a, a Blair Irvin the uh, third from Bentonville, Arkansas wide receiver. He was one of the more impressive kids at uh, the camp on Sunday. Uh, his dad played at K-State in the mid 2000s uh, under Ron Prince, I believe. So that was kind of an interesting little fun fact that I learned about him. And then uh, the other ones to really kind of hone in on, uh, the, the one is a 2027 prospect. So again, we're we're getting into the really younger kids and the younger classes right now with where these camps kind of stand out is uh, Tay Reach Reich, maybe, uh, from Minnesota, 2027 running back. He was very, very good, especially for being so young. Uh, so those three kind of stood out. Obviously, J.J. Dunnigan was probably the best player at the camp, and I think that he can contend for best player in the state in 2026 as a corner. Uh, unfortunately, he did not do many one-on-ones in the stadium on Sunday, so I, I would just would have liked to see that from a selfish standpoint, but during the drill work, he was really good and has really came a long way, and I, I, saw, I thought that he was going to be more of a safety, but I can really see him being kind of a physical corner as well. Uh, this Friday, though, is a big skill group, so I'm expecting to see a lot of good receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, tight ends, and just all your skill positions from the 2026 class, 2027 class, and even a few 2025s if they can make that work at a certain position. And then uh, the offensive line, defensive line camp, which is always one of the best that K-State has, is Sunday, so I'm kind of looking forward to that one as well. Yeah, that obviously uh, we know how K-State has done on the offensive and defensive lines over the past couple of years. I mean, two fantastic coaches uh, on both sides of that ball with Buddy Wyatt and Connor Riley. And uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of uh, what comes out of that, what other offers might be there. So that's uh, what's going on in the recruiting world of K-State. We'll be back again next week with another full-blown recruiting update for you. Obviously, if uh, there is a commitment come Sunday evening or on Monday at some point. We'll have that for you right here, full bl- breakdown of whoever it may end up being, and uh, you can keep it locked in with everything K-State football recruiting over at KSO. So find us on on three, which I every time I want to find a better way to say that, on on three just does not – It I sound like an idiot. Uh, well, so, on three. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess, but – I don't know. That sounds better. I go two on three and find Drew's recruiting updates on K State football. So there, that's how we'll do it for now. And uh, we'll be back again tomorrow where we'll talk a little bit more about K State. We'll go away from football, barring something unforeseen. Uh, if something happens to where we're talking football tomorrow, something bad has probably happened in terms of K State football. So cross your fingers that we're not talking football tomorrow. Uh, And then we'll probably get back on the football wagon come Friday because you people will probably want to hear a lot about how Avery Johnson's a stud. So uh, we'll give that to you most days here. But tomorrow we'll stray away from football, focus on some other things K-State related, and uh, get after it. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching today's episode of the KSO Show. Back again tomorrow talking the Cats.